unit two in five minutes. So let's talk about perception. And this is the process of organizing and interpreting sensory information. So when we talk about perceptual sets, it's how we perceive one thing over another. So in particular, top-down processing is when we perceive uh, our perception is guided by higher level mental processes like prior knowledge, experiences, expectations, as opposed to bottom-up processing where we're just essentially processing the raw sensory input. So just keep that in mind. Uh, for example, a child seeing a fire truck for the first time processes it based on color, size, and sound. Now we have what's called Gestalt principles, which are rules that explain how we are naturally organizing sensory information into meaningful wholes. So these typically will fall under perceptual organization in the sensation and perception unit. So again, this is going to support top-down processing. Look here on the right. And we have what's also called perceptual constancy, where you see based on recognizing objects that are unchanging, even when sensory input is changing due to lighting or distance. For example, you see a car in the distance, you know that it might be tiny in the distance, but we know that it has not shrunk. Now, it's important to know that cognitive processes involved in reasoning, choosing, and solving problems. How do we go about that? Well, you have algorithms, and that's step-by-step -step for problem solving. Think math e equations, for example. And then we have heuristics, which are mental shortcuts. These are good, but they can be prone to errors. So, for example, you forget your friend's Wi-Fi password, and you guess based on passwords that they've had before. Uh, it's quicker than trying every possible combo. It may work. It may not. Um, and when we look at availability heuristics, it's how we judge something based on how easily we can remember examples. So thinking of plane crashes are common after seeing them on the news. Uh, and then with representative heuristics, it's how we judge something that matches a prototype or stereotype. So assuming somebody who likes books and wears glasses must be a librarian, even if that is unlikely statistically. Now, in terms of barriers, we do have these are obstacles that interfere with our ability to solve problems. So for example, there are biases. Uh, we also have the issue with belief perseverance, believing something to be true even when it's been disproven. Uh, we have issues with mental set, confirmation bias, overconfidence, um, and ultimately how we make these decisions and how we process them too. You can look at the framing effect with, re with respect to how presentation influences ultimately our decisions. And so, for example, if we say something's 90% fat-free, it sounds better than being 10% fat-free, even though they mean the same thing. All right, let's go on to memory. And this is where we encode, we store, retrieve information. And off of the atkinson chiffron model, we have sensory information. That's where you first process that information, seeing, hearing, smelling. It's for a fraction of a second to maybe a couple of seconds. And then we have short-term slash working memory. And this is memory that holds information that you are currently thinking about or you're aware. Again, sometimes called working memory because it is actively processing and manipulates information. It may only last for about 20 seconds. And then, of course, there is long-term memory which is permanent and limitless storage of memories, mainly thanks to encoding. So when we talk about encoding, we're talking about the process of converting information into a storable format. Now, automatic happens without conscious effort, whereas effortful requires focused attention. Consider how you are practicing right now for the AP Psychology uh, to remember this, so it's effortful. We also have it based on semantic, acoustic, and visual. And this is based on meaning, sound-based, or image-based, respectively. There's also, of course, mnemonic techniques. So if you wanted to know the Great Lakes, you might be familiar with the acronym HOMES, dealing with H for Haran, Ontario, Michigan, Erie Superior. Also chunking, breaking it up, imagery, hierarchies, these are all also crucial uh, towards mnemonic techniques. Now, when it comes to storing memories, we have explicit memory of facts and experiences that you can consciously recall and explain, such as, for example, what you did your last uh, birthday, that's episodic, or general knowledge, like DC being the capital for semantic facts. Uh, when it comes to implicit memory, we're talking about things like writing about skills and habits that have been developed. These are basically unconscious memories. Uh, these are procedural skills, conditioned responses, and we thank many of our brain structures here, in particular the hippocampus for explicit and the cerebellum and basal ganglia for implicit. Now, when it comes to retrieving memories, this is, of course, accessing the stored information. So recall is retrieving this without any cues. This could be writing an essay on a test without any options, recognition, identifying correct information, such as options like multiple choice. Then, of course, we have relearning, measuring how much faster you can learn something a second time. So if studying for a final exam, you already learned the material before, so it's going to be faster the second time. When we talk about things like context-dependent, this is remembering information within the same environment. We also have state-dependent. That's where memory retrieval is easier when you're in your internal state, such as your mood, your emotions. That matches the state when you were encoding the memory itself. So happy time, happy time trying to remember it. And then, of course, we have priming, which is exposure to a stimulus that influences how you respond to a later stimulus, oftentimes without conscious awareness. So seeing the word yellow may help you recognize the word banana faster because of the association. Now, when it comes to forgetting the memory, we have the decay theory fading from memory over time. We also have things like interference, which forgetting occurs because other information is blocking or disrupting the retrieval of this target memory. So when we talk about proactive, we're talking about old memories blocking or interfering with the ability to learn or, or remember something new. And then we have reactive, which is new memories are blocking or interfering with the ability to recall old information. We also have something called retrieval failure when information is stored in long-term memory, but you just can't access it at the moment, sometimes called tip of, tip of the tongue phenomenon. And we also have motivated forgiving, uh, forgetting rather, in which you are that's occurring because the memory may be too painful, embarrassing, anxiety provoking. So your brain is actively pushing it out. There's also misinformation when false or misleading information is presented after an event that may alter a person's memory, especially when there's trauma involved. We also have imagination inflation when imagining an event increases over confidence that it actually happened even if it didn't. Then there's source amnesia when you remember information, but you forget exactly where or how you learned it. For example, you recognize a face, but you can't remember if it's from a movie, a friend, or let's just say a stranger.
And the last part here is with theories of intelligence. Now we have Spearman's G factor, which basically is looking at a single general intelligence factor. G underlies all intelligent behavior and cognitive abilities. People who do one uh, do well in one type of task are typically going to do really well in others. So it's sometimes called the common core of intelligence. Now, intelligence is not a single general ability, but rather multiple distinct types of intelligences. According to Gardner's multiple intelligences, so there are a variety from musical to spatial to linguistic. Then we also have Sternberg's triarchic theory, which proposes that intelligence is uh, made up of three components, expanding the view basically beyond the traditional IQ test, so analytical, creative, and practical. And this really broadens the concept of intelligence beyond just the academic skills. Now, when measuring it, it's really important when you look at these psychometric properties, we're looking at how good and useful a psychological test is. And there's a lot of controversy behind them in dealing with reliability, validity, standardization, norms, norm curves. So be very much aware of that, as well as bias considerations. If you're not from the same culture that the test might be administered in, there could be some cultural and socioeconomic biases there. Ultimately, we may have labels that come out of these IQ tests, gifted or maybe even intellectually disabled.